Welcome back to New Rockstars. This is The Big Question, the show that gives you too much information about whether humanity will be destroyed by being washed out at sea, swallowed by a volcanic pit, or eaten to death by insects. Not the beast! Ah! My name's MT, and I'm here with off-screen producer, Brandon. How are you doing today, Brandon? MT, I'm doing great. So glad to be back doing another Big Question with you. It's been hey. too long. If you guys don't know, Brandon was the first person I ever did a Big Question with, and he is the man. Oh, you're too kind of you're too kind. But yes, as Mobius and Loki search for the Lokius Loki variant along the sacred timeline, they also presented us with a pretty bleak future full of apocalyptic, but not planet ending events. That got us thinking about this week's big question. Could the apocalyptic events in Loki possibly be our bleak future? Ugh, they were bleak. Empty. Mega bleak, bleak events. Like super, oh. like some were even like 30 years away. Like the Roxxon thing was like 30 years away, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Ooh. <laughs> guess what, Empty? It's time to pull up REM on Spotify because it's the end of the world as we know it. And I don't <laughs> feel fine. Oh, no, me neither. <laughs> knowing that old song. Oh, boy. Yeah, this is going to be this could be some heavy stuff. As Loki was chasing down the variant that was hiding and naturally occurring apocalyptic events on the planet, we got a quick glimpse from both Loki and Mobius about some of the possible awful calamities in our future. OK, so we're going to okay. take today's big cue and we're going to like look at the likelihood of these events happening and what history might tell us of the outcomes if they do occur. OK. Okay, um, buckle up. Cruising on that main street. Yeah, it's going to get a little dark, okay? We're going to be discussing <laughs> some real-world events where innocent people who are just going about their daily lives were wiped out. But just like Mobius expressed to the Minutemen, we're going to be as respectful as we can. Yes. Uh, we can't change history, MT, but we can learn from it. We okay? can't change history yet, Brandon. Yet. yet. Remember, yet. Not until we get that power. Exactly. Should be like next week. <laughs> You're going to get the power to go back in time? <laughs> Uh, next week, yeah, out. I order off, off of Amazon. It should be around. Of course, there. Bezos can go back. <laughs> Bezos. <laughs> Every time they set up a union, he goes back in time and destroys it. Oh, my God. He's going to listen to this. Uh, I think we're, we're dead then now. The Bezos is coming after us. <laughs> I know. My, my Alexa is looking at me. Okay. <laughs> Listening extra hard now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're going to go uh, in chronological order of the events that occurred on the sacred timeline between 2047 and mm. 2051, according to the TVA archives, or what we heard Loki and Mobius talk about. So let's start with the climate disaster of 2048. Okay? All right. Woo! Climate disaster! <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Climate disaster! <laughs> mm. This one was pretty vague, okay? Mm. <laughs> it's just listed as a climate disaster, so that could mean a lot of things. Mm. A majority of real scientists, not those fake-ass scientists, <laughs> but real scientists agree that rising global temperatures from carbon emissions could lead to devastating planetary situations, such as mm. rising sea levels and extreme weather events. Mm. Uh, in 2015, you might remember, we had the Paris Climate Accords, which led to the creation of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC for short. The good old IPCC. You, you down with IPCC? Yeah, you know me. Uh, <laughs> you down with IPCC? Yeah, you know me. <laughs> yeah, you know me. The goal coming out of the Paris Agreement was to prevent a rise in global temperatures mm. from 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Right. It doesn't seem like a lot, but this is like a global average. So it'll be higher in some places, lower in other places. Right. Um, to do this, we need to cut greenhouse gas emissions globally. Now, why, you may ask, 1.5 degrees uh, specifically? Well, scientists agree that once we reach like that 1.5 degree threshold globally, there would be enough heat to push many of the natural systems that sustain life on this planet past the point of no return. Oh. Uh, so if we go past that 1.5 degree rise in global temperatures, the impact of climate events around the world would go from being like pretty destructive to absolutely catastrophic. Uh, great. <laughs> mm. So yes, yeah, so like we've already seen some effects of like rising temperatures and, you know, weather patterns are getting more severe. But if we go past that 1.5 degree Celsius rise, it's, you know, like, it's going to be the whole uh, toilet paper fiasco times a million. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You remember trying to buy toilet paper? Imagine that. You ain't going like to find no toilet paper during the apocalypse, mm -hmm. baby. None. You'll be eating toilet paper if you're lucky. We will be the toilet uh, paper. The wet toilet paper. <laughs> We're done. Yeah. <laughs> We're the Earth's toilet paper. The Earth is going to wipe its ass with us, darling. Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much. 
Uh, so in 2018, the IPCC released a report that laid out what could happen if global temperatures rise past that 1.5 degree danger okay. line. Here's some of the highlights, okay. if you will. <laughs> okay, highlights. 1.7 billion more people would experience severe heat waves at least once every five years. Damn. So people are people are already having extreme heat waves. You know, people in cities die from heat waves. Even in the good old US of A, if there's a heat wave, you know, people usually die. 1.7 billion more people would experience those heat waves. Bro, well, I at have least once got every five overactive years. sweat glands, my dude. I can't do that. <laughs> So that's, that's one of the things. Okay. Another thing, uh, the seas would rise on average another 10 centimeters, which is like almost four inches, which doesn't sound like a lot. But again, any a lot of places on the coast are at sea level. Mm. So four inches, it starts coming up. That water starts coming up. And this is, again, averaging out. Some places it'll be much higher. Some places will be much lower. I would agree that four um, inches is a lot, my friend. I would tend to agree <laughs> that four inches is very uh, significant. And... Uh, Four inches is a it's, lot. It's a lot, everyone. If there's anything that we can take from this video, it's that four inches is a lot. <laughs> it's a, any sort of measurement, whatever you measure four inches, it's extreme. All right, sorry, I'm just being 12. <laughs> Continue. Up to 700 million more people would become exposed to climate-related risks mm. and poverty. The coral reefs that support marine environments around the world would decline as much as 99%. Oh no, I love the coral reefs. The coral reefs, they're like the heart of the ocean. You know, they're beautiful. You know, the great they're, they're great to look at, dog. but they all serve as a function. It's all part of the ecosystem, okay? And then another another problem would be global fishery catches would decline by 1.5 million tons. Mm. Another one point, they're already declining. Mm. They would decline by another 1.5 million tons. People eat fish, you eat fish. I do love me some fish, some salmon, it's delicious. Yeah, well, say goodbye to it. It's gone. <laughs> oh, no. So we have like so so we pass this 1.5 degrees, yeah. right? The oceans rise, the coral reefs die. This affects ecosystems worldwide. Mm -hmm. Like right now, about 40% of the world's population live within 60 miles of the coast. Oh dang. Okay. So imagine those seas coming out. Those people gotta go somewhere. So we're gonna see like more global poverty, more global mass migration caused by climate change. Uh, and on top of that, we'll have these extreme heat waves that could be experienced around the world. So you'd have devastating effects on agriculture and food production. So rising past that 1.5 degree warning line could lead to an extinction level event. And maybe not humans being extinct at first, but certainly important species that are part of the ecosystem would go extinct. And this would just cascade and cause all sorts of problems. Uh, and probably doom us humans to be that toilet paper scenario we talked and about. And even earlier. worse, my deodorant could fail. And then nobody wants that. Oh, definitely. That's the worst part of the apocalypse. Definitely. Just smelly pits. Oh, st stinky people. <laughs> you might as well just kill me because I don't want to live in a world of stinky Bring on people. the meteor. Why not the meteor, Lord? So this climate disaster of 2048, what's the likelihood that this could happen? I mean, given humanity's past behavior and transgressions. Pretty I would damn high. I would agree. <laughs> Pretty damn high. I tend to agree, unfortunately. I mean, we couldn't even get people to put masks on. How are we going to expect them to, like, cut back on their oh, green man, It's gases? true. It's so true. Like, that's exactly the one yeah. thing I've been thinking about after all of 2020. It's like, bro, <laughs> we can't even do the simplest thing. How are we gonna stop climate change? Anyway. So I think Loki might be right on the money with this one. The TBA is right. 2048, watch mm -hmm. out folks. It's, it's gonna, gonna happen. Dangerous. Everybody go to Rock's cart. Just grab what you need. So the next the next catastrophic event on the TBA's list was the eruption of Krakatoa in 20. Krakatoa, my okay. favorite SpongeBob hero. Sorry, it's a SpongeBob reference. I apologize. <laughs> I mean, SpongeBob is like the blind spot of my trivia. I don't know my my SpongeBob trivia. You what? Well, so 2049, <laughs> we have the eruption of Krakatoa. Krakatoa erupted in 2049 as well. So Krakatoa has already had a major eruption once before back in 1883. Mm -hmm. So we can look at the history of that to get a sense what might happen when it erupts again, because Krakatoa will have another big eruption Damn. at some point in okay. its lifespan. I remember reading about Krakatoa as a kid, and it freaked me Bro. out. Okay. I was living in Florida where there are zero <laughs> volcanoes and zero chances for volcanoes. But I read about Krakatoa, east of Java. Uh, and I was sure that, that a volcano was going to just like open up in my backyard. and like It could happen. You and, like, never know. You never know. Happen. The chances are know. not... Zero? I mean, they are pretty zero. It's not zero. It's close to zero. <laughs> so Krakatoa, if you don't know, it's located in the Sunda Strait, which is in between two of Indonesia's largest okay. islands. 
Uh, the eruption in Krakatoa in 1883 was one of the deadliest and most destructive volcanic events in recorded history. Uh, it was long, too. It was a really long like kind of eruption. It started in May, but like the biggest and most devastating explosion didn't happen until August. So it's like it was like kind of slowly oh, sure. erupting, slowly happening, and then boom, shit goes right. off in August. So the big explosion that happens was heard almost 2,000 miles away in Perth, Australia. They what? Heard. And uh, another three, yeah, another three thousand miles away in Mauritius, they heard it. Get out of town, yo! Two thousand miles. How how loud was that? Like ten miles away. That must have been crazy. Well, here's the thing: the sound wave of the largest eruption is recorded to have traveled the globe like seven times over. Like it just like went around the earth, like just bro. <laughs> That's Are my you for real? Noise. Yeah. Sailors who were on boats like 50 miles away from the volcano, obviously they didn't yeah. see it, they hear it, and they lost their sense of hearing. Bro, we should have saw that in Loki instead. That so would have been wild. way cooler. I mean, like, apocalypses <laughs> are bad. Well, that's why he went to Vesuvius <laughs> and not Krakatoa. <laughs> Yo, that is the most mind-blowing fact. That sound yeah. fact is killing me right now. Wow. So Krakatoa explodes. Boom. You looking for this? The records say like over 36,000 deaths are attributed to like the eruption and the resulting mm. tsunamis. So like over 300 towns and villages were destroyed along yeah. like the strait where the island is because the tsunami kind of like traveled yeah. up that strait. Uh, and one one tsunami was created by pieces of the volcano like collapsing into the sea. And it was like 125 feet, 120 feet high which is about as tall as a six story building. So just imagine that big wave heading towards you. You're some, you're some guy, you're living near Krakatoa. You hear this thing, oh, that sounded awful. I hope I'll be okay. And then you see a giant ball. Brandon, you're telling me that all of this terrible shit, this is going to happen again? Uh, one of these days, yeah. It could happen again. I'm glad you asked. What? Uh, because <laughs> it's, Krakatoa like still erupts like periodically with mm. like smaller eruptions. Like there was eruptions in 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2018. And as recently as 2020, there was like another small eruption, but not the So big we've been having all of these close calls this entire time. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's good. You want, because volcano, the dangerous thing with volcanoes mm. is like pressure and time, right? And the more the pressure builds up, the more, it, the bigger right. the explosion is going to be. So I think these little okay. eruptions are good. If we, if there was going to be another huge eruption like there was in 1883, we'd probably have some advanced warning. Because remember, I said it started in May, but then really erupted in August. They just didn't know what was going on back then. So now we probably have some advanced warning. But even with a heads up, we could still see like oh, a no. massive loss of life. And definitely it's like oh, intense yeah. destruction. And then another thing to consider is all the ash ah, and volcanic gases that get dumped into the atmosphere. Like if you see a painting of Krakatoa, it has like this huge mm. plume coming up and all that stuff like affects the climate temporarily around the earth. Like it, it would cool temperatures in the northern hemisphere as like sulfuric gases from the volcano would go up into the clouds and it would make the clouds more reflective. And so it diverts like the earth's sunlight away from the earth, like cooling the earth. Uh, so cool. that's a problem. <laughs> and it, in our more populated modern world, like these temporary climate changes could cause more casualties yeah. than they did in the Holy past. Holy shit. What? Yeah. Yo, Don't mess with I volcanoes, did dude. not have a fear of Krakatoa before this video, and now I do. <laughs> Holy moly. Wow. Now you know I was scared. So that eruption that happens in 1883, it caused orange, orange skies, like yes. these beautiful orange skies around the world for like days, months afterwards, because it's dumping all this gas into the atmosphere. So especially in like the morning and in the evenings when the sun was rising and setting, they'd have these beautiful orange skies. And then at night, the moon was said to look blue instead of like the kind of grayish silver it looks now because <clears throat> there's all these different gases in the atmosphere. In fact, in fact, if you've ever seen that, um, the painting by Edvard Munch, yeah, the scream, a... that dude who's like on the yeah. bridge and he's like, screaming, the sky is like really orange yeah. and yellow in that painting. And it's thought that, he, the artist, he based that orange sky off the sky he saw in Norway because of Krakatoa. Yeah. He lived in Norway. Krakatoa is down in Indonesia. He's getting this orange sky because he finished the painting in uh, 1893. Okay. Uh, 
so that was like 10 years after. So in, in Norway, they were seeing these orange skies in 1883 and 1884. So like that's how hey, effective I mean, if you volcano. survive the volcano, I feel like your Instagram's going to yeah. be popping with amazing pictures. Right? I mean, great sunsets for Yo, Instagram. Yeah, mad sunset. likes Hashtag from, volcano you know, sunset. all four survivors. <laughs> you know, you will be blowing up. That's all we need to focus on with these apocalypse. How will my Instagram fare? How will I capitalize this? Can I put an ad on this apocalypse? <laughs> Hashtag sponsored post. And I don't know if you remember, MT, but in 2010, there was that big volcano in Iceland. I'm not going to try to pronounce it. That it started erupting and it affects like travel in and out of Europe. They had to oh, like, cancel flights and divert flights because planes couldn't fly. You can't fly through like this volcanic smoke. So again, that'd be like another problem that'd be caused by this. It would disrupt Dang. international travel. So Krakatoa... It's definitely going to erupt again. It's going to have another big eruption like in 1883. Don't jinx it, it man. I'm scared it's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> it's, also, it's also worth noting uh, that a volcano is believed, not Krakatoa, but a volcano is believed to be the, the cause of the largest of the five mass extinctions on Earth. There's been like five mass extinctions on Earth. And the largest one happened 250 million years ago. And it was the Permian-Triassic ah. extinction. And they scientists think like it was caused by a volcano doing that, like dumping stuff in the atmosphere, totally changing the climate and like killing off uh, a lot of the living creatures Dang. on the planet on the planet. It was a bad so don't time mess to with be volcanoes. in Permian Jurassic Park. Terrible time. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll list we'll list this one, you know, the re-eruption of Krakatoa. It's a possibility. But don't put don't you dare put that curse on me, Brandon. We don't need the Krakatoa. I'm scared of Krakatoa now. <laughs> Wow, I thought Krakatoa don't was Krakatoa. just a Spongebob. I mean, fun little joke. See... It was not a joke. Oh, jeez. <laughs> it's not fun. So next time you're near a volcano, you know, maybe make a human <laughs> sacrifice to the volcano gods to please, please don't, don't please. set off Krakatoa again. Our next apocalyptic event, it's the extinction of the swallow in 2050. 2050, the extinction of the swallow. Is that a thing? Completely screwed up the ecosystem. Uh, swallow's a really cute little bird, if you're not familiar. But uh, yeah, this one sounds sad, but you... You might be thinking, that's oh, just a bird. I care about birds. Birds are amazing. The bird is the word. Birds are beautiful. <laughs> birds are important. Bird is the word. As we're all aware, you know, the animals in the natural mm. world, they exist in a delicate balance. As all things should be. You know, we've always seen uh, the hierarchy of species. You know, there's uh, uh, the food chain, you know, humans <laughs> sitting at the top eating our McDonald's. Uh, <laughs> it's all the species, all, all of the animals, mm. they benefit from each other in different ways. Uh, and when one element of the food chain gets totally out of whack, mm. it can throw the whole system into chaos. Uh, and birds are a very important part of this balance. And we can look to history to see just how important one single bird species could be. I'm going to take you all the way back to 19, okay. 1958. Okay. When the leader of China, Mao Zedong, you may have heard of him. Okay. Uh, he launched the Four Pest Campaign. And this was like part of his, his like effort to kind of grow China and bring them into a more industrialized future. But the four pest campaign was designed to encourage the people of China to help eradicate four types of animals that they saw as pests. Uh, three of those animals were mosquitoes, flies, and rats, all because they spread diseases okay. such as typhoid, malaria, and the plague. And, you know, yeah, we're all done with mosquitoes. They no real benefit, really. What are they doing? They're not making honey. Well, you can make the art. So it's female mosquitoes that drink blood. Male mosquitoes, they drink like plant juice. And some male mosquitoes, they help with like, the pollination okay. of plants because they're drinking that plant. OK, juice. so down with the patriarchy, unless you're a mosquito. Gotcha. <laughs> the, the mosquito patriarchy is all right. They're just eating plant juice, guys. Yeah. The, the female mosquitoes are drinking that blood. So those were three of the animals. Okay, the fourth pest in the four pest mm. campaign was the sparrow. Uh, more specifically, the Eurasian tree sparrow. It was a cute little bird. Why, why did they hate this bird? It wasn't because it was spreading diseases. The government at the time thought that the sparrows were eating important crops, such as rice and grains. We got to get rid of them. So the citizens oh were encouraged God. to kill the sparrows on site, like shoot them out of the air, or at very least, like start banging pots and pans to keep them from nesting in trees. Get up! Get the hell up! Get up! And so that they'd constantly be flying around and just like <laughs> just That's die so of exhaustion. Sad. <laughs> Which That's is so, so sad. Just <laughs> like get out of here, you criminal! <laughs> there was one instance where it was like an embassy in China. I think it was like the. Polish embassy or someone, they had a bunch of sparrows in their tree and all of these citizens from these Chinese citizens like came around and started banging pots of pans 
And like the, the embassy would not <laughs> let them on the property. They're like, you're not coming in here with that bullshit. So they stood around the whole embassy for days, just banging the pots and pans, like insanity. Wow. Because uh, they thought they were being good citizens. That's what their leader told them to do. <laughs> so this started in 1958. By 1960, the Eurasian wow. tree sparrow was like nearly Poor extinct. Poor Eurasian China. tree sparrow. So like they did it, right? Problem solved. Okay. No. More problems. More problems. So it turns out that the sparrow's effect on the crops from like eating it was negligible. They were barely eating the crops. What sparrows like to eat are insects, specifically locusts. And so now that you've killed all your sparrows, the locust population exploded. And plagues of locusts like wiped out the crops, doing way more damage than the birds ever did. The sparrow extinction was one of the contributing factors to the Great Chinese Famine of 1959 to 1961. There was a lot of things that led to this famine. I'm not claiming it's just the sparrow, but it did not help that they killed off the sparrow and had these plague of locusts, which ate all their crops. The Great Chinese Famine led to the death of anywhere from 15 million citizens to 45 million Chinese citizens. It's hard to say because the Chinese government, yeah. you know, they didn't want to say how many people died, but the low ball they gave us was 15 million. And then a lot of historians think it's closer to like 45 million Chinese citizens. Holy smokes. You guys banged your pots and pans to death. God yeah. damn. That is so crazy. They did that in like two years. They wiped out like a whole species of bird. Uh, and that's just one example from history in one country. So what about our poor swallows future? Is there any chance for the swallow? <laughs> We're at least not out there shooting them. We're not banging our pots and pans. That's a good step. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> that's first a step, step in the right direction. <laughs> but already, um, you know, the annual migration of the swallow has been affected by global warming, our good friend, uh, and other human factors such as like chemicals, insecticides, pesticides, and habitat destruction have reduced the swallow population by 30% over the last decade. Boo humanity, boo! Boo humanity. So swallows, if you don't know, they they migrate between France and Africa. They they like fly back and forth. Like it's over 6,000 miles that they migrate. Mm. And you know what swallows like to eat, MT? They like to eat insects. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if the swallow populations continue to decline, we could see a rise in insect populations in multiple countries, which, you know, not fun. Okay. Ooh. And so by overusing insecticides, we wind up killing the insects that the swallows eat or... Sometimes the swallows still eat the insects, but they ingest like the harmful chemicals and it gets passed into their digestive system and it kills them off. So if we don't do something to help bring their populations back, we could see continual decline of the swallow and have long term effects on the ecosystem. So hashtag save the swallow. Yo, we got to save these birds, man. God, they'll be killing all these insects. Mm -hmm. Hashtag for real. We got to save that swallow. God save the dang. swallow. You're you're killing me with these facts, man. Let's go. I know. It's depressing. <laughs> this is a depressing sh- Loki is a depressing show. If you have anxiety, leave now or leave, <laughs> leave several now. minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> Rewind, go back in time and leave. Exactly. Um, so I'm going to rate the extinction of the swallow in 2050 as very likely. Oh no. <laughs> I'm very worried. Now. All right. I was not that worried. I thought it was like a funny mm-hmm. joke, but now I'm like very yo, scared. Yo, it is no. Yeah, I'm not trying to deal with locusts, y'all. I ain't trying to make this into the book of Exodus. Mm-mm. Let's just Mm-mm. save these birds. Yeah. Save these birds. You saw the cicadas this year. That was crazy. And their cicadas are harmless. Wait till the locusts come, man. Yo. That's going to be devastating. <sighs> okay. So our next <laughs> our next planetary apocalyptic event. This one we we really saw play out in the show. This is the Category 8 hurricane of 2015. Mm. Okay. Now, I myself, I'm originally from Florida, so I've lived through my fair share of hurricane seasons. And let me tell you, if you don't know, hurricanes suck. They are awful. They're scary. They're huge. They take, they they last so long. It's, they're not fun. They're not fun. Mm. Um, and as the climate gets warmer, hurricanes get stronger. Because uh, hurricanes, they build power over the ocean. They're sucking up the warm air and they get powerful and more powerful. And when a hurricane hits land, it starts to lose its strength and like eventually it dissipates. Mm -hmm. But as the planet continues to warm, the hurricanes retain more power as they come ashore. So they're getting more powerful and they're staying more powerful Mm -hmm. and doing more damage as they pass inland. So right now we rank hurricanes on a scale from one to five. It maxes out at five. And to give you an idea, a category one hurricane has sustained wind speeds of 74 to 95 miles per hour uh, and a storm surge of four to five feet. Now, storm surge is the rise in the level of water above norm- above the normal tide 
uh, as the ocean water gets pushed inland by the okay. storm. Like hurricane is so strong and the wind is so powerful, it's pushing the water of the ocean like just inland. And as you know, most coastal areas are pretty much at sea level. So even a category one with four to five feet, that can go yeah. pretty far inland. Yeah, like a couple, yeah, your house is um, destroyed. Yeah, houses destroyed. And now a category five hurricane has winds of 156 miles per hour plus and a storm surge of 19 feet plus. Yeah. What? Huge. So right now, like I said, the 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 table maxes out at five. The category maxes out at yeah. five. So if we were to like extrapolate the current scale up to a category. Oh, eight, no. This is nuts. <laughs> <laughs> it would be a hurricane that has sustained wind speeds of 246 to 324 miles per hour. Okay. And a storm surge of 30 to 40 feet. Wow. So that's 30 to 40 feet above the normal tide level. So, like, I'm pretty sure that would wipe out most of Florida just with the storm surge. Bro. I don't know if anywhere in Florida gets above, like, 40 feet. Don't even play. Don't, let's not even entertain the idea of a Category 8. That's, like, insane. Yeah. Isn't it? 246 yeah. I mean, miles per hour on the lower end. That's the low end. Yeah. Yeah. This would be, like, an extremely destructive hurricane. Uh, now, in Loki, we saw that the event report said that over 10,000 people died in Haven Hills, Alabama. That's, like, a pretty accurate representation of the destruction Damn. a coastal city would face from, like, a Category That's a 8 hurricane. That's devastating hurricane. That's devastating. Yeah, and you got to imagine it would be, like, huge. It's not just going to hit one town. It's going to hit, like, multiple yeah. towns. Now, buildings in hurricane-prone areas are tend to be built to, like, a certain code to withstand tropical events. And we can think that by 2050, we might have stronger building materials. But even then, it's still like an extremely devastating storm with like tons of wind damage and severe coastal flooding. Now, you might be thinking, well, is a Category 8 hurricane even possible by 2050? Like, could we, it's the Earth going to get warm enough to get us there? And I would say most definitely. Damn. Um, <laughs> uh, in 2019, we had Hurricane Dorian, which is one of the strongest storms ever recorded in, in the Atlantic. And it reached sustained wind speeds of 185 miles per hour, which if the hurricane scale didn't currently max out at five, if it kept going up, that would have been a category Holy six hurricane. Mode. It technically was, but because it's not on the scale yet, we still call it a category five, but it was like pretty much a category Damn. six. So I'm going to rate, you know, the category eight hurricane of 2050 as very likely. Great. <laughs> this could be in our future. I think we oh, could see it. Oh, boy. <laughs> Oh, hot dog. I can't wait for that. Guys, stop driving in your cars. Get a bike. Seriously, let's all just bike to work. <sighs> I'm sorry. This is the most depressing <laughs> week you. You're going to see this show. Oh, I hope. I hope, boy. Okay. On to our next apocalyptic event. Another one they mentioned was... Or oh, the tsunami of 2051. Go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. This one was pretty generic. We didn't hear much. You just said the tsunami of 2051. We've already discussed the threat of like rising ocean levels from climate change. But the sudden rising of ocean levels from like a tsunami would be catastrophic. You know, in recent history, we've seen the destructive nature of tsunamis. You know, there was, of course, a tsunami in Japan. That happened in 2011, which was caused by an earthquake underwater that was a 9.0 to a 9.1. And then if you remember in 2004, there was another tsunami caused by an underwater earthquake in the Indian Ocean. That one was a, scientists aren't quite sure, but it's like somewhere between a 9.1 and a 9.3. It's a huge, huge underwater earthquake. I forgot about this. Like that tsunami in 2004 killed over 277,000 people. Yeah. I was in the sixth grade and like, you know, being in sixth grade, you don't really watch the news, but that is what everyone was talking about. Yeah. You could not have not heard about the tsunami. It was devastating. I don't, and I don't even remember like, you know, you heard about tsunamis, but like that was, you know, in our lifetime, a real yeah. world example of just how yeah. dangerous it is. That tsunami in, in 2004 did over $15 billion in damage. And the earthquake that caused it was like the third largest ever recorded and created tsunamis over 100 feet high. Over 100 feet high. It was one of the deadliest natural disasters in recorded history. Bro, that is hell on earth, bro. That is hell on earth. Holy. F Sorry. I guess I'm swearing on the show. I, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's <laughs> worth the holy, I think. So, again, like devastating, you know, you can't imagine what it would be like to have something like that happen. I guess the positive is the humans Yay! didn't cause it. It's not our fault. But like, that's just one of those things. Like, I don't think you can blame that on climate change or anything. It's just. That's how the earth works and, you know, earthquake's going to earthquake uh, and it's going to cause tsunamis. But 
Yeah. Man, it's scary. There's nothing we can really do to prevent one of those happening again. Like, it certainly could happen again. But all we can do is continue to be scientists. You know, let's continue to study mm -hmm. seismic events and improve early warning systems. Like, that's the most important thing. Having ways to evacuate people who live on the coast, knowing ahead of time, you know, oh, there's this big earthquake underwater. We got to get people away from the coast. Like, that's the most we can do to help save lives and help prevent like these huge disasters from happening again. Also, we can tell our upstairs neighbors to stop stomping so loud. Um, that would be a, a really big help Dude. with earthquakes. Thank God my upstairs neighbors are not in an ocean because they would cause tsunami every day. Yeah, I feel like I feel like it's just an upstairs neighbor thing to do. I feel like they all just gather around in a secret yeah. society. Like, how hard should we stomp on Christmas, kids? How big should we make our shoes? <laughs> we need to make our shoes Look bad. at me size 16 we for my size nine feet. <laughs> We are the upstairs neighbors and we will make noise. <laughs> the evil cabal of upstairs neighbors, they're, they're the worst. <laughs> Number one worst. So I'm going to list uh, the tsunami of 2051 as a possibility, you know? Yeah, uh, unfortunately. Uh, the only thing I can suggest, everyone move to Kansas. Get away from the coast. <laughs> I mean, that should be the state slogan of Kansas. Kansas, don't worry about the tsunamis. <laughs> <laughs> and the Wizard of Oz wasn't real. <laughs> It wasn't a real movie, so don't worry about the tornadoes. Kansas. Didn't work out well for the clutters, but, you know, that's an In Cold Blood joke. The, cut that. Kids don't read In Cold Blood. They don't know the clutters. Yet. Uh, Just kidding. <laughs> yet. It's a great book if you haven't read it. Highly recommend it. Really kicked off the, the crime genre, the true crime okay. genre. Oh. Great stuff. Uh, so the last apocalyptic event, this one they technically didn't give a date mm. to, but when Loki was doing his, uh, you know, Ragnarok on Mobius' salad, he mentions when he's listing off like what could be apocalyptic mm. events, he mentions supernovas. Um, and I've always like kind of been interested in supernovas. So I'm going to include supernovas on the okay. list. So this apocalyptic event would be a supernova near Earth, like close enough to do damage to Earth. Now, you might be asking yourself, Brandon, what is a supernova? Well, a supernova is the explosion of a star. Uh, and it's the largest explosion that happens in space. Uh, so stars are kind of confusing. There's all types of different stars. Um, and I barely understood what I was reading about <laughs> stars. Um, <laughs> but it, a supernova is like part of the death sequence of a star. So a star has like all these elements inside of it. And it's it's huge. Like the sun, our sun, is considered a pretty small mm. star. But you could fit like something like a million Earths inside of it. I heard it was sun. a million and it's huge, one. huge, right? Oh, is it a million and one? <laughs> they got one more in there? <laughs> They're just cramming one more in there. It was like, we have room. The st stars have like all these elements inside mm. of them. Uh, in fact, like every element that's on Earth comes from exploded wow. stars. You know what I mean? Uh, nitrogen, hydrogen, gold, silver, wood. Is wood an element? <laughs> I don't know. It all comes from stars. We're all made of exploded stars, baby. Yeah. Uh, you're a star. I'm a star. Everyone, uh, you're a star. If you're in the comments saying bad things, you're not a star, but it's okay. But you can be a star if you'd be better. So a, su so a star has all these elements uh, and it's, it's big. So it's like heavy and all these elements are getting pushed towards the center mm. of the star. Uh, by gravity and so they're smashing together and like you have nuclear fusion going on inside of mm. the star but eventually they the star runs out of elements to fuel itself and so it kind of explodes like everything kind of crashes into each other mm. and it explodes so that's the supernova the okay. star is dying when a star does go supernova it can be seen you can see it in the sky like from earth it'll be like an extremely bright light uh it'll be like one of the brightest things you would see at night and sometimes you can even see them during the day. And we know this because like throughout ancient history, you know, different astronomers from different parts of the world, had, you know, they watched the stars a lot. They had no TV. They had no Internet. So they had to watch the star show. Uh, and it's every day <laughs> at night. <laughs> and they kept track. And, you know, that they, they lived by the stars. Uh, so they would notice when like there was a new bright ass star in the sky and they'd be like, where the heck does this come from? I guess we should kill a bunch of people because God's mm. angry or something. Um <laughs> But so we know, we, you know, we can look at history and then astronomers have gone back and said like, oh, this, you know, this ancient society, they saw this random star for mm. a couple of weeks. Um, and then we've realized by looking into space and like looking at the history of light and all that stuff in space, like, oh, it was a supernova. They saw a supernova. Mm. And so sometimes they've happened and they haven't had much of an effect on Earth because they've been so far away and, you know, it, it, it's not really hurting us. But what if a star near Earth went supernova? Um if a star that was um, kind of that was closer than eight parsecs to Earth, which is twenty six, wait, parsecs are real. What parsecs are real? I know it sounds like a fancy term. Okay, but it's real. I had no idea. Continue. <laughs> 
So if a star, if a star that's within eight parsecs mm -hmm. of Earth goes supernova, it would destroy half of the Earth's ozone layer. Just like all the radiation would just like destroy the ozone layer. You'd be like, oh, that's mm. probably a bad idea, right? It's a horrible idea. Um, Cause this would expose Earth to like harmful cosmic and solar radiation. Uh, and it would be really devastating to the ocean, like the phytoplankton and like all the little creatures on the, the reefs, our beloved coral reefs uh, that use light to f fuel themselves. It would just like wipe them out. And that, that would totally just, destroy the marine ecosystem, and then destroy the rest of Earth's ecosystem. A nearby supernova is thought to be the cause of the late Ordovician mass extinction that occurred on Earth 450 to 440 million, million years ago. This supernova exploded and dumped tons of gamma radiation on Earth, killing off over 60% of the oceanic life on Earth. And I think most of the life at that time was oceanic. So this was the second largest of the Earth's five mass extinctions. If you remember, I brought up the mass extinctions earlier. Wow. This was number two. Uh, and they believe it was caused by a supernova that was close enough to Earth that it sent so much gamma radiation to Earth. It wiped out most of the life on the planet, like totally changing the trajectory on life. Like if this hadn't happened, maybe us smart apes wouldn't be here. You know what I mean? Because the ocean life would have just prospered. Wow. It would have been Aquaman in this bitch. <laughs> it's like, it's just so crazy to think just how fragile like our earth is because like yeah. anything like it's just crazy yeah. how everything works out like to this day, even though like things are starting to degrade the fact that like we've had such a perfect earth for such a long time is incredible yeah we're our our existence of life on this planet is just but a mere blip you know the earth's been around for a long time mm -hmm. and there's been these mass extinctions and like other species other types of life didn't get a chance to thrive uh and we're by we're hanging on there <laughs> by a thread <laughs> So the bad news is we can't really predict what star will go supernova mm. or when it might happen. But astronomers are pretty confident that there are no stars close enough to Earth to do any serious damage okay. in the near future. Well, that's good. Um, so we should Ooh. be okay for our lifetime. I don't know about it, like our great grandkids, but hey, man, you know, them kids, bro. <laughs> buy a star suit, kid. Come on. <laughs> no, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag f them kids. But what a sunset. <laughs> what a sunset indeed. Yeah. So the next time you're out there and you're wishing upon a star, you know, maybe wish for it to have a long, yes. healthy life cycle. Yes. You know? So I'm going to list like the supernova event, something we don't have to worry about that one. We should be okay. Okay. Um, and if it does happen, maybe it'll just kill us instantly and we won't even notice. Hopefully. Because uh -huh. I got bills, Brandon, and I don't <laughs> want to pay them. Uh, Man, if, if a supernova goes off and I have to pay my bills, I'm going to be pissed. I'm going to be pissed you know as I mean? hell. Like floating in the void, like getting freaking statements. Yeah. T-Mobile's still sending me bills. I'm like, there's no ozone there. How are you still sending me bills? Sally Jeez. May's like, I know the earth isn't here, but come on. <laughs> you still got student You're loans? You're overdue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So speaking of things that will eventually be extinguished, MT, be sure to check out our limited edition Loki merch available this at newrockstarsmerch.com. Okay, we got t-shirts. Stickers, buttons, hats, and hoodies, and they're not going to last much longer than the six episodes of Loki. And they may even be gone before then. So get cracking and grab yourself some cool merch while also being helpful to this channel so we can keep making all the cool stuff you like. Head on over to newrockstarsmerch.com. So that's my list of possible apocalyptic events, our bleak future that Loki has presented. <laughs> and I think a few of these are pretty possible. So I don't know, you know, maybe once Loki is done, you know, take that last ride out of here. No, no, live long and prosper. That's what I gotta say. I hope we live long for a very long time because yeah, me too. God, you know what? Let's just. I, the only thing that we should probably take for this video is just take every day um, as a gift because oh, it's a beautiful thing. That's a blessing. It is really beautiful uh, that we get to wake up, see a beautiful sunrise, and not die. It's great. Eventually, that sun will go supernova and kill us all, but we'll be long gone. Not my problem. <laughs> not my problem. <laughs> But only metaphorically. <laughs> All right. Um, and <laughs> Please. <laughs> Anyways, before we dive into our bite-sized questions next, some words from the folks that help make Big question possible, starting with Cuts Clothing. A lot of folks are starting to do more in-person work and having to put 
on non-pajamas for the first time in months, which is really unfun. Not not great. I'm not so fun. sorry. Um, and you don't want to look like you just rolled out of bed, but you also don't have to sacrifice comfort for timeless style. For that, there's Cuts Clothing. The folks at Cuts Clothing have taken a classic men's fashion style, the plain tee, and refined it, combining premium quality with a minimalist aesthetic. Cuts founder, Steve Borelli, reinvented the t-shirt and made what GQ magazine calls the only shirt worth wearing. Their signature Pika Pro tri-blend tee is a bold new take on a classic design. I have some cut shirts myself and they both look great and also feel really nice on my skin and my skin likes nice clothes on it. So I'm very grateful for that. And Philip is a big fan of the way they fit and he cares a lot about that kind of stuff as he should because he's a very strong and muscly man and he probably looks very good in shirts. He's a beautiful, beautiful man. man. This a beautiful, beautiful man. man. This is the second time <laughs> in the week that I've complimented <laughs> Philip's physique. Anyway. <laughs> Can't help it. It demands to be complimented. It's true. He earned it. It's not just a lifestyle. It's not just clothing. It's office leisure apparel for the sport of business. Get 15% off your first order by going to cutsclothing.com slash big question. That's cutsclothing.com slash big question for 15% off the only shirt worth wearing. Big Question would also like to thank Credit Karma. Credit Karma has always been there to help you make better financial decisions, and now they want to help you even more. With a Credit Karma Money Spend account, you can be rewarded for good money habits. Credit Karma Money is a brand new checking account where you can win cash reimbursements for making purchases. When you use your Credit Karma Money debit card, you can win daily Instant Karma purchase reimbursements on items up to $5,000. Just pay with your debit card, and if you win, you'll be notified on the spot, and your Instant Karma cash will be added back to your spend account. Credit Karma Money has already given away over $3 million in Instant Karma. Open your FDIC-insured spend account for free. No minimum balance requirements, no overdraft fees, and free withdrawals at over 50,000 ATMs. Right now, visit creditkarma.com slash winmoney to open your free account and start winning Instant Karma. Go to creditkarma.com slash winmoney to sign up for free and start winning Instant Karma. That's creditkarma.com slash winmoney. Instant Karma is sponsored by Credit Karma. No purchase necessary. Exclusion and terms apply. See rules. Banking services provided by MVB Bank Incorporated. Member FDIC. Maximum balance and transfer limits apply. Okay, MT, it's time to dive into our bite-sized question. And I got a good one for you today. Okay. This question is, in Thor Ragnarok, what happened to Gungnir when Asgard was destroyed? Would it have survived that event and still be floating around in space somewhere? And this was asked by the real Odin seventy three on Twitter. Probably once his gun mirror. Okay. You know oh I mean? shit! The real Odin. We about to get that <laughs> back for you, bro. That's a real good question. The real Odin seventy three. The Odin spear that we see in Thor, Thor of the Dark World, and Thor Ragnarok is named Gungnir. It is made of an extremely tough metal called Uru, just like Mjolnir and Stormbreaker, and it is a symbol of Asgardian kingship. In the MCU, Gungnir dates all the way back to at least Bor, Thor's grandfather and Odin's dad, and Bor fought a mighty war. I don't know if you remember in Thor 2. Mm. I love that rhyme. He's like, Bor fought, fought a mighty war. My father, King Bor, waged a mighty war. MC Odin, dog. <laughs> MC Odin, woo woo. And he, of course, wielded it against Malekith and the Dark Elves. And it would then be passed down to Odin and became his main weapon, as we see him wielded a few times in the films. And when Loki takes over Asgard, while his papa was taking a long nap, he wields Gungnir as the ruler of Asgard. And he even uses it to kill his real daddy, Laufey. Who's Laufey now? Not you. Sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I literally the spear is able to project powerful amounts of energy and can even channel dark energy to act as a teleporter similar to the Bifrost. And Odin uses Gungnir to send Thor back to Earth to retrieve Loki in Avengers. And Gungnir can also be used to operate the Bifrost, just in case, you know, you misplace Heimdall's sword, even though it's it's pretty fairly in there, but Gungnir can be used to replace it if needed. And of course, the last we saw of Gungnir was in Thor Ragnarok, when Thor faced off with his sister Hela in the throne room. And he kind of just leaves it there while dealing with her, and then Surtur comes along and does his whole destroying Asgard to fulfill the prophecy thing, which is, you know... I mean, it's what he was yeah, made to do. It's, he was pretty excited his, about it. I mean, he's still job. pretty happy, and I'm happy for him. He was very yeah. happy. He was like, well, I'm yeah. doing it. I'm doing it. <laughs> I'm finally <laughs> doing it. I'm killing these rich motherfuckers. Killing them all. <laughs> How fulfilling. How fulfilling. Right? He's living his dreams. This I hope he's happy so now. Good. Like, what did he do after? Uh, we should do, like, a. This should, this should be a Marvel short where, like, Surtur goes to Disney World or something like that. <laughs> I can't believe I did it. Maybe my ex-wife will respect me now. He's just that like TGI Fridays, like, I'm going to destroy these 
Most <laughs> realistic like I, I just w- I want to search her show in the style of the Modoc show. That would be hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so, is Gungnir gone forever? It's possible it was destroyed, but like most enchanted items in comics, these important things tend to stick around. Until we know that it was completely destroyed, like, you know, Mjolnir, I wouldn't count it out of the picture. I mean, it's probably floating around in space somewhere, like I said before. It's very, very strong stuff. Uru is really, really powerful stuff, so it's it's going to be really hard to to get rid of that. And, like, as we know, in Thor 4, Mjolnir's coming back somehow, so, like, Uru's here to stay in the Marvel Universe, so it's probably just floating around. Hopefully, yeah. uh, Gore doesn't have it, because if Gore has that shit, that's a problem. That'd be a real problem. Or maybe some Ravagers picked it up while sifting through the wreckage of the destruction of Asgard. I, I could see uh, Stakar wielding the Gugnir. He, he, he could do it. <laughs> Sylvester Stallone. Playing could around do with it. it. Doing, a, doing a little Star Wars know. kid action. Know. But either way, we could see Gugnir in Thor Love and Thunder. Again, hopefully not in the hands of Gore the God Butcher because he already has that necro sword. So we don't need a uh, dual wielding action there. Maybe they'll get it to Valkyrie somehow and she can wield it on Earth. Oh my god, that'd be so sick! She deserves it. I hope she goes and gets it, honestly. No, make someone else go get it. She's the boss now. Someone else can go get it. She'll send the flying horse to go get it. All right, it's somewhere over there. It's somewhere up there. Go get it. Figure it out. (laughs) That is it for that question. But thank you for that question. It was really good. But do you know what part of the show it is, Brandon? It's time for the Box of Scraps. (gasps) Box of Scraps. Box of Scraps. Tony Stark was able to build this in a cave with a box of scraps. But today's box of scraps question, Brandon, is what type of apocalypse do you think you'd be most likely Hmm. to survive? That's a good question, MT. It could be any type of apocalypse. Any type of apocalypse. Um, You know, I think I would do pretty well if there was some sort of um, Lego apocalypse where... (laughs) <laughs> everything let's say one of these supernova pops off right everything gets turned to lego mm-hmm. uh and i have to rebuild society <laughs> i think i could do that you know i think i could you know form myself a little lego car little lego house little lego gun that shoot little lego bullets you know i think i would do all right <laughs> it'd be kind of like a real world like minecraft minecraft right like just kind of putting everything back together just building it up the legopolis i i dig the luck <laughs> Dude, I hope I make it to the Legopolis. Yo, I Legopolis is cool. I feel will everyone mutate and get those weird little crab yeah, arms? Yeah, we'll all have little, <laughs> little sea arms. arms. We'll be able like, to change our hair however we want it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean that'd be a pretty good uh stress, a less stress. I feel if you have like yeah. interchangeable Lego parts, you know, it's right? Like, but when you sit down in something, you're gonna have to shove like the little Lego parts into your Lego yeah. Parts. That's gonna be a very uh, aggressive. We got like buttholes now, right? But like, <laughs> cheek holes i mean we yeah. always had buttholes but we have butt cheek holes now so three holes yeah. on the posterior very uh interesting anyway <laughs> the lego apocalypse i like that one honestly i i feel like i would probably do well in i mean i don't think there's any the, the, I, in most <laughs> apocalyptic scenarios i'm gone i'm a goner right i think i'd probably do well in a zombie apocalypse scenario because okay. like you know I, I, everyone says that but like i feel like if you think really rationally and just go to an area where there are no people Mm -hmm. then you'll be good like just climb a mountain and live off the land like grab a bunch of books on like how to survive off the land and just go up and because like let's be real if these are american zombies these these guys are not climbing mountains they're gonna be like uh you know nah i'm good i'm still (laughs) no i'm good i'm just and i I, i'm american so i i I would probably be that zombie um, so like I would just be chilling up on a mountain with my uh, uh, How to Survive the Apocalypse for Dummies that I stole from the library, not planning on returning. Um, and I think I'd be pre- I think I'd do pretty good, especially if they're, that's the, a good if they're the slow zombies. Yes, but if they're fast zombies, I'm done. Yeah, you know the fast zombies. That's a modern contrivance. You know, traditional zombies are pretty slow. I, I hope you know, people always complain like, why do they always make such bad decisions in zombie movies or like on The Walking Dead or whatever? It's because that makes for good entertainment. You don't, you don't want to watch the zombie movie where people are just successfully surviving. It's a boring movie. Yeah, it's a movie. boring ass movie. But I feel like if the zombie apocalypse did happen, especially in America, like in like South America, like the Southern America, they would yeah. have a field day with that shit. <laughs> mm. They would just shoot yeah. all the zombies. They would be gone. 
it'd it, be fine. They would be one hundred percent fine. All right. It, it's if I got turned into a zombie, I think I'd I'd focus on McDonald's rather than like brains. <laughs> I'd just be like Big Macs. He's like mm, Big Mac line empty. <laughs> Big Macs. <laughs> I think zombies uh, tend to like Brain Mac instead. The I don't know. Mm, that's clever. Like, I like that. Pretty good. I hear it's delicious. <laughs> but yes, <laughs> that's my answer. <laughs> and that is it for this episode of Big Question. And I want to give a special thank you to off-screen producer Brandon for joining me this episode. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you for having me, MT. This has been a blast. Sorry it was so bleak, but how much Dude, fun Dude, I had. learned a lot. <laughs> I literally learned so much. So thank you for just keeping it real. It's just keeping it real. But again, at the Let's end of the day- Let's just enjoy the moment now, people. Just don't think about the apocalypse. Just enjoy the moment yeah. now and do what you can to stop the apocalypse from happening. Anyway, follow Brandon at Grin and Barrick on Twitter. And then you can follow me at Mastertainment on Twitter as well if you want to, you know, read a bunch of nonsense. Nonsense. But most importantly, follow New Rockstars on Twitter. But most importantly, on YouTube. And make sure to hit that notification bell so you can get notifications whenever we upload a video. And make sure to send us your big questions using the hashtag big question. Subscribe to our podcast feed and leave us a nice rating and review that always helps us out a lot. We really appreciate it. And yeah, we'll catch you guys later. Peace. See ya. Bye. Bye.